Hi guys, hope you're doing fine. This is part three of the four-part video series on Ajaz Ahmed's essay, The Politics of Literary Postcoloniality. Uh, but before you start watching this one, I have to make a request. Please make sure you watch the previous parts uh, first before starting this one. It would make much more sense. Uh, it you would understand this one better if you've already watched the other two parts that are up on this channel. Also, uh, one more thing, this part is going to be slightly longer than all the other ones because it covers the longest section of the, the essay. Uh, I promise the next one is going to be super short because that one is only about two pages. Okay, So, uh, let's move ahead and begin this one. So, in the previous two parts, we have established the following points. In the first uh, section, Ahmed critiques the homogenizing tendencies of some famous post-colonial theorists and these famous post-colonial theorists include Bhabha Spivak and Edward Said. <coughs> he also analyzes a passage from one of Spivak's books. He picks up some phrases that she had used in that book, in that passage and critiques them word by word and shows you how Spivak's ideas, according to Ahmed, are not placed in the actual reality of colonized nations, of the problems of its people and their history. Okay? In the second part, Ahmed shows how the term post-coloniality came into being in the 80s and 90s and uh, how the meaning of the term had changed and had no connection with the debate about post-coloniality in the 70s. Uh, also, he shows you what meanings this term now carried in the second wave, this term post-coloniality, what meanings it carried in the 80s and 90s and what are the problems with those meanings and what are the problems of the approach of these critics in using this term post-coloniality in a certain way. So, broadly we've established that critics like Bhabha, Said and Spivak show an elitist, a postmodernist, very textual sort of attitudes in theorizing about the post-colonial world. Okay? Uh, when they state, according to postmodern theory, when they state that concepts like Marxism and nationalism and history have ended, it appears they are, that they are rejecting any possibility of actual material struggle that can take place to end structures of power, structures of oppression. Okay? So, in this part, in section 3 of this essay, Ahmed will broadly focus on only three issues, mostly all of them from Bhabha. Uh, and it's really simple to understand once you realize that whatever Ahmed says in this essay goes into three directions, the critique of three points mainly all of them from Bhabha. Okay? And what are, what are these three points that he is going to critique? Number one, he is going to critique the theme of hybridity, ambivalence and contingency. It's totally okay if you don't understand this, uh, what a contingency is and uh, maybe specifically what ambivalence is. I'm going to explain this for you later. But uh, mainly the first thing is that he's going to critique hybridity, ambivalence and contingency. will show you how Baba is misplaced by using these terms, how he again rejects the possibility of political action. The second theme that he's going to critique is the fact that these critics, the post-colonial masters, these elitist critics, they believe that the nation state has collapsed. So, the second theme is of the collapse of the nation state. The first theme was that he's going to critique is hybridity, ambivalence and contingency. The second theme that he's going to critique is the collapse of the nation state. And the third theme that he's going to critique is the theme of a globalized postmodern electronic culture. I know that these terms and these phrases may uh, uh, sound a little alien right now, but don't worry, these are quite easy, very simple to understand and I'm going to show you how. So, this is the quick introduction. Now, let's move on to the text. Several of these issues get focused quite sharply if we look at only three of the themes that are quite common among such critics. A. The theme of hybridity, ambivalence and contingency as it surfaces especially in Baba's writing but also much beyond. B. The theme of the collapse of the nation state as a horizon of politics. C. 
the theme of globalized postmodern electronic culture which is seen at times as a form of global entrapment and at other times as yielding the very pleasures of global hybridity let me take up very briefly the latter two issues decline of the nation state globalization of the electronic media before i offer more extended comments on the concept of hybridity and contingency so basically he introduces you to his intention of what he is going to do in this part of this essay uh, he also tells you that the theme of a globalized postmodern electronic culture it appears that at the electronic culture of the tv of news channels of internet the electronic postmodern culture is a globalized culture which is sometimes seen as a problem which traps us and sometimes appears as a pleasure that helps us connect globally and have a global hybridity we are going to dwell on this of course later when he talks about this actually so in this para there's nothing new to add he's just telling you that first he's going to take up the last two themes the theme of collapse of the nation state and the theme of globalized postmodern electronic culture uh, it's only later that he's going to take the first theme in detail okay so uh, that's it about this paragraph let's move on to the next one he writes it is doubtless true that independence of the nation state in the imperialized world is getting greatly circumscribed by the global offensives of capital and that the imperial formations especially in western europe are marked by an increasing interpenetration of national capitals so that transnationally in sorry transnationally integrated finance capital has achieved a far greater autonomy with regard to state controls exercised in individual countries but that is only one side of the story that southeast europe and the territories of the erstwhile soviet union are marked today by the emergence more or less more or less catastrophic emergence of more and more ethnically based nation states should lay to rest all the euphoria about the global decline of the nation state at the apex of the world system on the other hand the nation state is alive and well in both the united states and japan in western europe itself the union rests on negotiations among nation states and the largest and most powerful of these nation states germany has just achieved an expanded national unification and is unlikely to surrender its national interests to the union as not only its negotiations within the union and the unilateral exercise of financial power by its national bank but also its newly defined national interests in eastern europe amply demonstrate okay before moving on to simplify ahmed's words for you i would briefly like to tell you what the collapse of nation state means see the term is simple nation states are collapsing it means that with globalization as globalized uh, globalization engulfed more and more countries uh what happened there was a sort of opening up of national borders not in terms of boundaries and not in terms of political geography but in terms of the permission for a sort of capital investment and cultural investment for example uh, in terms of capital investment it's fairly easy to understand that foreign countries were now uh, allowed to invest in other countries uh, advanced capitalist countries were now allowed to invest in maybe third world countries and other countries this was the capital investment part as far as cultural capital investment is concerned uh, now information could be planted straight into the people of these other countries for example the coming of mtv uh, it somehow modified the culture and the nation state the country in which that's happening had no control on it because before this happened uh, maybe for the much of the 20th century national governments possessed actual powers to manage economic and ideological intervention by other countries in the contemporary times though after so many decades of globalization now both economics and information have grown out of control out of authority of the national governments today distribution of capital as well as information 
both have grown out of control of national governments and totally in control of the advanced capitalist nations. So they invade our country through their wealth as well as their information which plants cultural ideologies straight into the citizens of these uh, weaker nations so to say. Okay? So this is uh, understood as the collapse of nation states. According to uh, elite critics like Baba Said and other postmodern critics, uh, nations, the concept of nation states has collapsed. So in the first line, Ahmed states that it's true that the independence of the nation states is greatly cut down by the intervention of foreign capital. Of course, once, once uh, strong countries invest their capital into weaker countries, the independence of the nation state is curtailed. There's no doubt to that. The investment of more and more capital, more and more foreign transnational capital investment has resulted in the increase of the autonomy of imperial powers. Pay attention. It has resulted in the increase in the autonomy of imperial powers, especially those of Western Europe. And it has resulted in the decrease in the autonomy of individual nation states, the authority of individual nation states. So he says, yes, this is happening, no doubt. There is a challenge to the independence of uh, nation states. But there's another side to this story. While the imperial formations gain more and more autonomy by investment of capital transnationally, side by side, there's an emergence, especially in southeastern Europe, Ahmed says, uh, of ethnically based nation states. So uh, this phenomenon of emerging of stronger uh, ethically based nation states should lay to rest all the excitement and all the euphoria about a global decline of the concept of nation states. It's really not happening. Okay, he says, he says nation state is the concept of nation state is still alive in the US and Japan. The US as we all know is made up of so many states. Japan is made up of so many different islands and yet both these countries are ruled by a president, a single president as a single nation state. Uh, there may be disagreements between various states. Uh, there may be autonomy that has been assigned to different states, but not at all a total breakdown of the nation state as professed by some critics. Even in Western Europe, Ahmed brings an example of Germany where uh, in the Western Europe where a union has been formulated, there's an EU, you know that. It depends upon negotiations between various nation states. What is the EU formed of? It's formed of various nation states. There's no uh, such collapse of nation states. The EU is still formed of it. And even in the EU, Germany, countries like Germany, they insist on retaining their nation state status. They strengthen their nation state status. They express their power as a nation state, even within the EU, the European Union. All right, so we cannot say, Ahmed uh, insists, that there has been a collapse of nation states. Of course, there's a challenge to it by capitalism. There's a challenge to it by foreign investment and foreign cultural in intervention, but uh, not a collapse for certain. All right, so let's move to the next paragraph. Within Asia and Africa, the past decades have witnessed not the decline of the nation state form, but its further consolidation. As a mechanism for regulating markets and revenues, as a site for the production of national bourgeoisie, as an agent in the local and regional wars, within regions, national economies are more differentiated today than they were on the morrow of independence, as the experience of South Asia testifies. Transnational projects such as that of Arab nationalism have collapsed as the national bourgeoisie of each state has developed its own particularist interests. Now he comes to give examples from Asia and Africa. He states that in these regions, nation state has not weakened at all. In fact, it is growing stronger by the day. It is on the basis of national identities that markets are regulated. National bourgeoisies are formed nationally and it is on the basis of nation states that local and regional wars are fought. 
even within regions like take south africa uh, south asia for example there is such a huge competition between national economies you take example of india and china even bangladesh there's so much of competition between national economies what is this competition based on it's based on the definition of different nations india versus china versus bangladesh uh, this is how they compete on the basis of their national identity so we cannot say that nation state has collapsed and uh, a very relevant example is is of the chinese uh, attempts at invading india recently if china did not have a separate identity as a nation state what is it invading india for it's invading india for further political expansion for strengthening his uh, its image as a nation state all right so uh, that is not happening and therefore nation state doesn't appear to be collapsing also transnational projects like arab nationalism the the, the concept of arab nationalism which was based on a solidarity between members of many islamic countries is uh, they were fighting together for uh, reasons that were there uh, uh, that, that were unified okay arab nationalism has collapsed all right so there the transnational structures that were signaling towards the collapse of nation state like arab nationalism have collapsed all right so this is what ahmed mentions to strengthen his claim that the nation states uh, the concept of nation states is not collapsing anytime soon and he states further and i'm reading from the text alongside this trajectory surely imperialism has penetrated far more deeply into national economies than was the case in earlier decades more significantly most national uh, most national bourgeoisies have achieved a far greater level of capital accumulation and have therefore developed a contradictory attitude towards their own nation state and what's the contradictory attitude they wish to more or less bypass the regulatory aspects of the state through liberalization marketization etc and yet utilize it both for securing the domestic conditions of production favorable to capital and for facilitating the articulation between domestic and foreign capitals in other words the new national bourgeoisie like imperialist capital itself want a weak nation state in relation to capital and a strong one in relation to labor so we see that side by side ahmed admits imperialism is penetrating deeper and deeper, deeper into national economies at one point of time we see that nation states are strengthening but at the same time imperialist countries imperialist economies are penetrating deeper and deeper into other national economies so if i were in a classroom right now i would have said that ahmed being a marxist i cannot completely reject the sexual connotation of this sentence imperialism penetrating deeper is like imperialism screwing the third world or economically weaker countries but since i am not in a classroom right now i am not authorized to say anything anything so i would avoid using that metaphor and so remember i said nothing okay so he goes on to say that even within these countries the national bourgeoisies have acquired so much capital that they have developed a contradictory attitude towards their nation state so keep in mind malya keep in mind nirav modi these are the national bourgeoisies we are talking about and many other indian names you have in your mind so uh, imagine what they want from a nation these people want they have a contradictory attitude towards their nation at one point uh, they want a weak state they want to when it comes to taxes when it comes to repaying their loans when it comes to flowing their capital outside the country and flying away in case of a fraud uh, what they want is a weak state a state that they can easily bypass so on on the one hand they want a weak state that can be bypassed when they want to evade tax structures and other liabilities but at the same time they want to use the state to create conditions to help them attain more capital for example they want the state 
to create better infrastructure, better roads, better facilities so that their production can increase, their profits can increase and their capital can increase. They also want to regulate labor rules so that labor doesn't get too powerful to protest against their exploitation. So in these terms, they want a strong state. So the national bourgeoisies of particular countries have a contradictory attitude. On the one hand, they want a weak nation, uh, nation state when it comes to their liabilities and they want a strong nation state when it comes to the infrastructure and labor regimes. The famous retreat of the state is a retreat mainly from the realm of welfare and social entitlements combined with very aggressive interventions in favor of capital as much in the so-called liberalization schemes of countries like India as in the monetarist policies of the Reaganite Thatcherite in, right in the West. Not to speak of the dissolution of the communist regimes and rise of conservative market-friendly regimes in the erstwhile Comcon countries. It is in this framework that the nation-state remains globally the horizon for any form of politics that adopts the life processes of the working class as its point of departure and which seeks to address the issue of the exploitation of poorer women, the destruction of the natural environment by national as well as transnational capitals or the rightward shift or rightward drift of ideological superstructures, all of which are deeply connected with labor regimes, gender related legislations and ideologies and investment and extraction plans guaranteed by the nation state. So in these lines, Ahmed shows you how even if we admit that nation states is collapsing, it's not a good news. It's a bad news because it always it's, it's all, it also translates into the collapse of other structures, structures like Marxism, for example, that was working for the betterment of the working class. So other structures, for example, uh, maybe we uh, think that feminism is collapsing as a structure, as a, as a concept. So if we believe in the collapse of these structures, then the project of the betterment of the working class, the poor, the women, and uh, women, environment, they all are suspended. So in this paragraph, he's explaining the same thing to you. Uh, the retreat of the nation state basically refers to an essay by Susan Strange, which kind of declares the end of nation state and also the general agreement between many postmodern critics that yes, nation states have ended. Ahmed says that the retreat of nation state is only a retreat, a deliberate avoidance of the issues of welfare and social entitlements. So they want a retreat for sure, but they only want a retreat from when there's a question of giving something to the disadvantaged and giving people what they have a right to uh, get, okay, like welfare and social entitlements. To make matters worse, this avoidance of welfare issues is combined with aggressive interventions in favor of capital. Uh, they, they don't want to give welfare and social entitlements, but they want uh, to make things easier for them to attain more and more capital. It's combined with major exploitative measures to create more and more capital for the already economically powerful. Policies like liberalization and marketization in India and monetarist policies, um, policies that aim to control the amount of money in circulation in the market. Uh, so monetarist policies of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, you must be knowing that Ronald Reagan was the 40th president of the United States and Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister of Britain at a point of time. So these policies are aimed to make the rich people richer and the poor people poorer. How is that true? I'll uh, let you know. In India, the economic liberalization happened in the year 1991 and it was uh, the Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao who wanted sort of a balance of trade and he did away with the licensing scheme of companies in India which was called the License Raj and there was a whole, um, what do you call it, a mafia of License Raj. He did away with that system and opened the, uh, the markets uh, with an automatic approval of foreign direct investment in many sectors. This was how India was opened up to foreign direct investment to make a balance of trade. 
the monetarist policies of Tom, uh, of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were focused towards controlling the amount of money under circulation. Uh, Re Reagan's regime decimated the communist organizations. The communism was uh, virtually finished uh, in Reagan's regime. All right. And Thatcher is very infamous for increasing taxes at the time of national crisis. Whenever there was some national economic crisis, uh, she has been known to increase taxes time to time. She was also infamous for reducing expenditure on social services like education and housing. All right. So you see that how communist regimes, uh, com communism was uh, being crushed how poor people were bearing the burden of making the rich people richer and how uh, foreign investment was now allowed into countries like India so that uh, now uh, the uh, imperial countries are exploiting countries like us uh, both economically, naturally and culturally in newer ways. So Ahmed thinks that it's only if we make our politics nation state centered if we on uh, certain structures like nation states and marxism and feminism and envi environmentalism if we uh, make these structures as a point of departure for our politics then the issues of the working class the issues of the exploitation of the poor and the issues of women exploitation exploitation of natural environment can be taken up but if you say that there's a collapse of nation states and along with it there's a collapse of every other concept with postmodernism, then what about the issues of all these disadvantaged groups? They also are somehow crushed. Oh, okay. So uh, also uh, crushing of these structures of, uh, of formations that were speaking against exploitation also means the crushing of the left wing politics the rightward shift in ideology okay the uh, left wing politics stood against labor regimes it stood for gender issues it stood against the economic exploitation of people of a nation state so as the ideology shifts rightward as we see in india with modi as we see in uh, the us with trump and maybe uh, other nations as well so as we see that yes uh, globally the ideology is shifting towards the right and the left is being decimated we know that the politics that stood for these disadvantaged groups is also being crushed such collapse means the collapse of several other structures that worked for the betterment of the marginalized sections of the society so you don't need to celebrate the collapse of nation state one it is not collapsing and two even if it is collapsing it's not a good news because it comes with the collapse of several other formations that were working for the betterment of the marginalized okay i'm coming back to the text now the structural dialectic of imperialism includes in other words the deepening penetration of all available global spaces by the working of capital and intensification of the nation state form simultaneously this dialectic produces contradictory effects in realms of culture and ideology the same arab magnates and irani mullahs who chase petrodollars across the globe those same saffron yuppies who are opening up the Bombay Stock Exchange and the computer industry of Bangalore for foreign capital organize their lives around the fetishism of commodities bequeathed to them by advanced capital, but are also the ones most vociferous in propagating the discourse of authenticity and cultural differentialism in the name of Islam in one space, Hinduism in another, in order to forge proto-fascist nationalisms for the working masses of their own nations so as to wean them away from the progressive projects of socialism and anti-imperialist nationalisms. Within this context, speaking with virtually mindless pleasure of transnational cultural hybridity and of politics of contingency amounts in effect to ind endorsing the cultural claims of transnational capital itself. So, Ahmed goes on to say that imperialism produces a contradictory effect in terms of culture and ideology. And how the effect is contradictory? He tells us that the same Arab magnates, the same Arab business tycoons and the Irani mullahs 
the uh, Islamic clerics who chase petrodollars. It means that the, the same empowered people sort of, one is uh, economically empowered, the business magnates and Irani mullahs are religiously empowered, the, who desperately hanker after foreign capital uh, in return of oil. And the same saffron yuppies, he calls them saffron yuppies, so you can easily make out that uh, Ajaz Ahmed is not pro-right wing for sure. He refers to the RSS, BJP and the Hindutva Brigade as the saffron yuppies who cry of an authentic Indian identity, of an authentic Hindu nation. And uh, these are the same people who allowed foreign capital in the, both the cases, even in the cases of Arab magnates and Irani mullahs and in the case of these saffron yuppies, these are the structures that allowed foreign capital into the Indian society. They on the one hand love P.A. Carden pens and Rolex watches, but propagate the discourse of authenticity on the other hand. This discourse of authenticity is a means to forge, to construct a sort of proto-fascist nationalism so that the masses can be diverted. Their attention is diverted from the more serious, more progressive issues uh, uh, and more progressive uh, movements against capitalism and imperialism. All right. So, Ahmed says that uh, when these critics reject the possibility of a true nationalism, reject the possibility of structures that can fight against imperialism, against capitalism. It seems that they are themselves endorsing the cultural claims of transnational capital itself. You know what they are doing? They are uh, advocating a postmodern concept of collapse of every structure. So, structures have collapsed, so the possibility of revolution, the possibility of protest and resistance has collapsed as well. So, by professing a cultural hybridity, contingency, ambivalence, uh, what they are doing is they are giving even more increased space for transnational capital to plant itself in the weaker nations. All right. So, uh, after talking about the collapse of nation state in detail, which was the first theme that he was going to discuss and he has discussed it by now in quite a detail, he moves on to the second theme that he mentioned and this is the theme of globalized postmodern electronic culture. I am going to come back to the text and read on. For it is the claim of IBM, CNN, etc. that they are indeed the harbingers of a culture of global productivities, knowledges, pleasures. Again, it is doubtless true that a global informational regime is being constructed. But is one to celebrate this process as a globalized hybridity or to conceptualize it as the penetration of far-flung globally dispersed households by uniform structures of imperialist ideology that now have the technological means to bypass the national education and informational grids so that the national and metropolitan sections of capital can be integrated ideologically via CNN as much as they are integrated economically in, let us say, the Bombay Stock Exchange. So, Ahmed goes on to say that even IBM and CNN, uh, IBM the computer giant and uh, CNN the international news agency, who thought they have revolutionized, revolutionized the world by bringing pleasure, knowledge, cultural advancement globally, uh, Ahmed thinks that it's not a matter of celebration as a globalized hybridity. It's, it's, if you try to understand it, actually, it's a means of planting imperialist ideology, imperialist cultural influence, because now the educational and informational structure could be bypassed easily. I told you when I talked about the collapse of nation states that more and more control of the advanced capitalist country countries also meant that now they could bypass the information structures, they could bypass the educational structures through IBM and CNN with the coming of uh, computers, with the coming of internet along with it, with the coming of news agencies that are uh, international. Uh, now that grid can be bypassed and they have a direct access to the minds of people in these countries. So, the cultures of the metropolitan could now be integrated with national cultures without any interference on the part of the state. 
So now CNN and IBM played the same role ideologically that the financial capital investment played in the Bombay Stock Exchange. So one is penetrating the country in terms of capital investment and the other is penetrating the country in terms of ideology, in terms of cultural modification. Ahmed further writes, the answer to that question would determine in discussions of politics whether one foregrounds the contingent moment of TV induced hyper reality or the structural offensive of capital. Furthermore, this regime of electronic pleasures is being imposed at a time when the African continent is mired in a secular decline of its economic systems and infrastructural facilities to the extent that some, some two-thirds of the population in sub-Saharan Africa is set to live below the living standards of the colonial period. With the increasing decay of roadworks, transport facilities, electrical grids, schools, textbook production and the social fabric in general, not to speak of nationwide epidemics and ethnic genocides. It is not at all clear how the celebration of a post-colonial, transnational, electronically produced cultural hybridity is to be squared with the systemic, systematic decay of countries and continents and with decreasing chances for substantial proportions of the global population to obtain conditions of bare survival, let alone electronic literacy and gadgetry. So, Ahmed continues to explore the question whether one should celebrate what CNN and IBM try to show us or we should understand their impact as a means of cultural penetration. So he says that the answer depends upon your politics, upon your point of view, whether you want to believe the moment uh, of that pleasure that TV gives you, the TV that creates a hyper reality, a, a reality that is so much higher, so much more euphoric than reality, uh, whether you choose to see that reality or you want to see the actual conditions in which the imperial powers are trying to attack the lesser countries, the weaker countries in form of capital investment. He says that the regime of electronic pleasures of the internet, of TV, of uh, cultures like this, uh, he says, and, and pay attention that he calls it a regime, he strays that electronic uh, gadgetry, electronic uh, invasion is a sort of a regime, a structure of power which is imposed on us. We, we are forced to consume it and this uh, by creating a hyper reality in our heads. We get pleasure out of it. We get used to it. All right. So um, this hyper reality is imposed on us at a time when in countries like Africa, People lack the bare facilities to survive. Their economic systems, their infrastructure, and their roads, their rail, their school, their books, all the systems are breaking down. They're living even below the standards that were in the colonial times. All right, there are nationwide epidemics, there are genocides, there are so many problems that these uh, people in these continents are facing. So he asks you a question whether you want to see the TV induced hyper reality or you want to see the actual condition of the countries that were attacked by colonialism and that are attacked by imperialism in the contemporary times. So he asks you and he asks them how can we celebrate the TV induced hyper reality, the postmodern electric electronic culture, a global culture of postmodern electronics? How can we celebrate that when certain people uh, on the planet are suffering from such dire lack of facilities that are required for basic survival? How can you even think about electronic literacy and gadgetry when these people are suffering for food and water and basic facilities? So uh, again, he thinks that if you talk about elitist concept of postmodernism, of uh, uh, hybridity, of the uh, uh, electronic postmodern culture, you ignore the suffering of these people and you create a hyper reality that is not actually true. Ahmed further writes, such are in short the material coordinates. What is the internal logic of this theorizing? The idea of hybridity which presents itself as a critique of essentialism partakes of a carnivalesque 
collapse and play of identities and comes under a great many names takes essentially two forms cultural hybridity and what one might call philosophical and even political hybridity so now the factors that we discussed above the collapse of the nation state and the post modern electronic culture uh, he has discussed those uh, themes and now he comes to the theoretical part uh the collapse of the nation state and postmodern electronic culture was something material now he comes to the theoretical part what's wrong with these critics theorizing in the concepts of cultural hybridity ambivalence and contingency but before moving forward you should know what hybridity contingency and ambivalence is and i'm going to give you just one sentence or two sentence explanation about these concepts what hybridity is uh, like a I shouldn't be saying this but like a hybrid car that runs both on diesel and petrol hybridity culturally means that a person who has migrated to some other country has his own identity as well as he takes up the identity of the nation he moves into so there's certain mixing of two cultures that take pl takes place between uh, in inside his consciousness he incorporates elements from two different cultures into a single identity so one is neither eastern nor western neither this or that completely and essentially so there's a hybridity in the in, in, in his cultural identity okay ambivalence basically means mixed feelings so ambivalence in post colonial context means that a person does not really know how he feels about a certain concept for example sometimes one may be complicit with the colonial process and sometimes he may be resistant to it a same person is not all the time resistant to the colonial structure nor he supports the colonial structure all the time there there takes place this process inside his consciousness where he is not being able to either resist or support the colonial structure there's an ambivalence in his mind never completely in one state okay and contingent basically means context specific whatever happens at the moment of the event factors that arise at a moment when an event is happening are the contingent factors right there and then what happened is contingency for example the contingent factors of a riot what happened at the moment when the riots broke is there contingent fact okay so he comes to the concept of hybridity hybridity first emmet says that the idea of hybridity celebrates the collapse and play of identities and is mainly in bhaba's estimation is mainly of two types one is cultural hybridity and the second is philosophical or political hybridity so let's read further ahmed writes the basic idea that informs the notion of cultural hybridity is in itself simple enough namely that the traffic among modern cultures is now so brisk that one can hardly speak of discrete national cultures that are not fundamentally transformed by that traffic in its genera generality this idea can only be treated as a truism since a generalization of that order cannot in any specific sense be wrong the steps that follow this truism are however more problematic at two ends of the same argument this condition of cultural hybridity is said to be a specific to the migrant more pointedly the migrant intellectual living and working in the western metropolis and at the same time b a generalized condition of post modernity into which all contemporary cultures are now irretrievably ushered so that the figure of the migrant especially the migrant post colonial intellectual residing in the metropolis comes to signify a universal condition of hybridity and is said to be the subject of a truth that individuals living within their national cultures do not possess edward said's term for such truth subjects of post coloniality is cultural amphibians Salman Rushdie's treatment of migrancy as floating upward from history from memory from time as he characterizes it is likewise invested in this idea of the migrant having a superior understanding of both cultures than what more sedentary individuals might understand of their own culture by the time we get to bhabha the celebration of cultural hybridity as it is available to the migrant intellectual is in the metropolis is accented even further bhabha's words now <clears throat> america leads to africa 
The nations of Europe and Asia meet in Australia. The margins of the nation displace the center. The great Whitmanesque sensorium of America is exchanged for a Warhol blow up, a Kruger installation, or Maplethorpe's naked bodies. So let's begin simplifying this paragraph right from the first line. Ahmad, first of all, tries to simplify the concept of hybridity for you. He says hybridity means that the interaction between various cultures has become so frequent that one cannot speak of pure identities, of unique cultural identities, identities that are not affected by such interaction. So he says it's so common and simple that it cannot be debated upon. Yes, hybridity does happen. However, there are problems on the implications of this idea. What this hybridity, hybridity entails is this. Only a migrant, in, in Baba's terms, only a migrant and more so a migrant intellectual living in the metropolis can experience this cultural hybridity. It appears in Baba's term that only the person who's uh, number one, a migrant, number two, an intellectual, and number three, living in an advanced capitalist country can experience this cultural hybridity. Okay. And the second is this, that this cultural hybridity supports the idea uh, of a condition of postmodernity into which all contemporary cultures are now pushed. Hybridity and postmodernity, if you can see by now, are somewhat parallel concepts. It's in postmodernity that the collapse of all identities happen. And even in cultural hybridity, the collapse of the original organic identity happens and mixes with another uh, uh, identity and becomes hybrid. So, in a way, since this is a postmodern world, every identity is hybrid. So, by placing every identity on the one hand and of the migrant intellectual's identity on the other hand, Bhava sort of equates this and it appears that the migrant intellectual's hybridity, his identity, the hybrid identity is now a universal condition. All right, he becomes a universal subject. And uh, this is the condition uh, of which the native living in his own country is not a possessor because neither he's a migrant, neither he's an, nor he's an intellectual and nor is he situated in the advanced capitalist country. So he's not the possessor of such hy hybridity. Edward Said calls this, the universal subject, a cultural amphibian. You see, amphibian is in itself an achievement, being able to live in water as well as in land. So, somehow this migrant is superior to the other people living in their native lands. Especially so for Salman Rushdie, who defines the migrant as someone rising above uh, in history, in place, all right, uh, who is who, uh, as compared to the native who has just experienced a single culture. So, both Bhaba, uh, all Baba, Saeed, and Rashti admit that this identity, this migrant individual's identity who has left his native place, have moved, has moved to another country, especially an advanced capitalist country, has experienced two culture, cultures and is in a superior position. All right. So, um, they celebrate this hybridity as it is available to the migrant intellectual in the metropolis. So, Baba says uh, that all the traditional demarcations of identity have now been erased as he says that America leads to Africa, Europe, Asia meet in Australia, margins of the nation displace the center. Okay, so the theory of hybridity in other words celebrates the identity of this migrant intellectual. So, it's really funny to think that uh, in a way, Baba, Saeed and Spivak and critics like these, they celebrate their own position of their own hybrid, hybrid position of being a migrant, being an intellectual, being positioned in a country that is an advanced capitalist. In a globalized space, this identity is a celebrated identity, uh, whereas the identity of the people who do not choose this life is somehow considered inferior to this hybrid identity and that's the first problem that there is with the concept of hybridity okay let's move on with the text in baba's writing the post-colonial who has access to such monumental and global pleasures is remarkably free of gender class identifiable political location 
In other words, this figure of the post-colonial intellectual has a taken for grantedness of a male bourgeois onlooker, not only the lord of all he surveys, but also enraptured by his own lordliness, telling us that the truest eye may not may now belong to the migrant's double vision. We are given also the ideological location from which this truest eye operates. I want to take my stand on the shifting margins of cultural displacement that confounds any profound or authentic sense of a national culture or organic intellectual. Having thus dispensed with Antonio Gramsci and more generally with the idea that a sense of place, of belonging, of some stable commitment to one's class or gender or nation may be useful for defining one's politics, Baba then spells out his own sense of politics. He says, the language of critique is effective not because it keeps forever separate the terms of the master and the slave, the mercantilist and the Marxist, but to the extent to which it overcomes the given grounds of opposition and opens up a space of translation, a place of hybridity. This is a sign that history is happening in the pages of history. I request you to please underline the last line. This is a sign that history is happening in the pages of history. It's going to come really handy when we critique Baba as he creates this textual version of activism and says that history happens in the pages of theory. Okay, so let's come to the simplification of this paragraph. So by now it has become quite clear to us that in Baba's perception, the post-colonial person comes out to be this elite, high-class person who has access to this kind of ultra-modern forms of pleasure. He talks about a Kruger installation, he talks about a Warhol blow-up, he talks about a Maplethorpe's uh, art. Uh, so he talks about these ultra-modern pleasure which, are, which uh, are accessible only to a number of elite intellectuals, only an elite and an intellectual would actually enjoy and understand the postmodern nature of these artists and their art. Intriguingly, uh, Ahmed says, Baba does not dwell on the gender, class or ideology of this post-colonial individual. So it appears that he has taken for granted that this post-colonial intellectual is a male, he is a bourgeois onlooker, he, his point of view, his ideology is, he thinks that he is a lordly, superior being who views everything, judges everything with his double vision. And how this vision is double? Once again, in critics like Baba, uh, this man, this a uh, bourgeois man has progressed from a sedentary native position to a person who has now knowledge and access to another apparently more postmodern culture. So by belonging to the, uh, be, not uh, say belonging, but having experienced two cultures, this person has acquired a double vision. Baba claims that he has attained this superior position, this post-colonial intellectual with a double vision has attained his superior position in the moment of his displacement. Uh, that all his politics arises at this moment of displacement is what Baba says, that the post-colonial politics arises at the moment of displacement, the moment when he leaves a culture and enters into another one. Also, uh, he believes that this displacement dissolves any sense of an authentic belongingness to his original culture. At the time a person steps into another culture, he leaves behind his authentic belongingness, the strong sense of belonging to an authentic identity. He, uh, uh, this identity, the sense of identity is dissolved in the moment of displacement. So, a person who moves abroad in Baba's terms leaves his identity, his national culture, leaves behind a sense of place that defines him of belonging, of some stable commitment to his class or gender or nation. He leaves all that behind. Okay? Uh, these identities could have become the point of his politics. But since he has experienced the moment of displacement, uh, he has left all his politics behind and post-colonialism is the only politics that he stands for. Okay? Now, Baba goes on to explain his politics. He says that the language of critique 
the project of theoretical exploration against a structure is effective for two reasons. It's the quoted paragraph that I'm discussing. He says that it's effective for two reasons. Why the theoretical exploration of a structure is effective? Number one, it erases the distinction between the master and the slave, the trader and the Marxist. In other words, oppositional categories are dissolved because everything is now hybrid identities are mixed fused together so you can't say that this is a slave this is a master this is a trader this is a marxist and they have oppositional ideologies which is i don't know how true but bhaba says that this is number one reason why the theoretical exploration against a particular structure is effective number two this erasing of oppositions, of differences, this separation, it opens up new grounds. According to Bhaba, when we dissolve such solid differences, new grounds open up, new spaces open up and these are the places of hybridity. Okay, so you see how there's the breaking down of structures like Marxism and mercantilism. Uh, 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 it's postmodern and it's hybrid. The dissolution of fixed interests, of fixed allegiance, of fixed identities is quite postmodern in its nature. And this mixing of inclinations and ideologies also results in hybridity. Uh, Bhaba uh, so vehemently advocates it. But more importantly, <coughs> I'm sorry, Bhaba also says that. This is a sign that history is happening in the pages of theory. I made you underline the sentence because it's very, very, very important. Uh, a single sentence that can familiarize you with the problems Ahmed has with Baba. So uh, what are the problems this statement of Baba uh, creates? So number one, he says that happening of history is only possible with a postmodernist stance. Only when all uh, boundaries, all structures, all points of view dissolve in a post-modernist modernist way is history possible. So people who are not post-modernist in their uh, point of view, uh, they are sort of unable to write history. This is the first uh, conclusion from Baba's words. Second, that he says that history is happening in the pages of theory. I already told you that uh, Ahmed has a great problem with the way Baba uh, professes that political activism somehow is inferior to textual activism, writing, theorizing, all right? So he says that saying that history is happening in the pages of theory makes the prospect of activism very, very textual and Ahmed does not like it. And third, for political activism, according to Baba and uh, what we uh, learnt about him by now, uh, the intellectual has to be a hybrid, only a migrant intellectual situated in an uh, in advanced capital country, in an advanced capital country, can write history, can contribute into the writing of history. What about people who are placed in their native cultures, native countries, native identities, uh, have an organic relationship to their belongingness? Uh, for Baba and critics uh, in his group, um, the migrant intellectual has to be displaced. In the moment of his displacement, will start his politics of post-colonialism. All right. So uh, displacement is necessary. Since the native intellectual has not suffered displacement, can he not write about post-colonialism, even though he has suffered the colonial politics and colonial exploitation firsthand? This is another problem uh, that Ahmed has with Baba. Let's quickly move ahead with the text now. And I'm reading from it. Cultural hybridity, truest eye of the migrant intellectual, which is posited as the negation of the organic intellectual as Gramsci conceived of it, is thus conjoined with a philosophical hybridity. Baba's own language of critique is philosophical hybridity, which likewise confounds the distinction between the mercantilist and the Marxist, so that history does indeed become a mere happening in the pages of theory for the most part. These hybridities, cultural and philosophical, lead then to a certain conception of politics which Baba outlines in his essay. The, post the name of the essay is The Post-Colonial and the Postmodern: The Question of Agency, where we are again told that the individuation of the agent occurs in the moment of displacement 
assessment because contemporary post-colonial discourses are rooted in specific histories of cultural displacement. This pairing of hybridity and agential displacement then calls forth a politics of contingency, while contingency is defined as a defining term of counter-hegemonic strategies. This elaboration of hybrid displaced contingent forms of politics is accomplished with the aid of a great many writers including Ranajit Guha and Veena Das. The latter reference should detain us somewhat since it comes with a direct quotation from Das, greatly approved by Bhava, which denies that there may be such a thing as an enduring caste consciousness to which one might refer in order to understand any particular caste conflict of the kind that is so common in present-day India. So, in Bhava's terms, Ahmed says, this cultural hybridity gives the migrant intellectual a superior standpoint. According to Bhava, okay, he thinks that uh, this migrant intellectual has a truest eye, uh, a, a superior standpoint with which he can judge uh, and uh, theorize and uh, create his discourse of post-colonialism. So, this results in the rejection, in the negation, in the impossibility of the existence of an organic intellectual, an intellectual that's attached to his roots, so to say to his place, to his nation, his identity. Bhava only values the migrant intellectual's philosophical hybridity. He does not value the organic intellectual who is placed in his homeland and his identity and place. Uh, but this migrant intellectual which who is endowed with philosophical hybridity which erases all distinctions between opposite standpoints like the master and the slave, the trader and the Marxist and so on, basically saying again that this intellectual has to be postmodern. And Ahmed critiques how for Baba, history remains merely a happening in the pages of theory. We've already discussed that. On the basis of this cultural and philosophical hybridity we just discussed, Baba goes on to formulate further his politics of postcoloniality on the basis of another concept called contingency. So, what is contingency? It is the moment of an event's happening, the situation that created an event. So, in his essay, The Post-Colonial and the Post-Modern, The Question of Agency, Baba says that the individuation of an intellectual, uh, the point of departure of his politics takes place in the moment of displacement. I have already told you that before. It means that the basis of all politics of the post-colonial intellectual arises out of his, mo uh, of his moment of migration, of his moment of displacement. This goes on to be formulated as the politics of contingency, meaning that the moment of displacement and the situations arising thereof become the sole factor creating his post-colonial politics and allowing him counter-hegemonic strategies. Only this intellectual, who is culturally hybrid, who is philosophically hybrid, whose politics any, uh, is initiated in the moment of displacement, only this intellectual has the counter hegemonic strategies against the structures of power is what Baba believes. Now this view Ahmed says is supported by many other writers included the subaltern groups Ranajit Guha and Veena Das. Veena Das deserves special attention here because Baba is quite impressed by her arguments and so much so that he includes her quotations to solidify his points. Thus, in her work, denies that there may be such a thing as, and pay attention, as an enduring caste consciousness. That to say that uh, someone uh, is caste conscious or someone's conflict, someone's uh, action arises out of his caste consciousness is an essentialism according to Das. Okay? So, simply speaking, this means that she says, when caste conflicts arise, when a lower caste revolts against a higher caste. So she says we shouldn't connect that action, that participation, that so the feeling of struggle to his to the participants' caste consciousness. The the lower class people, the participants of that conflict, the lower caste participants of that conflict did not act the way they acted because of an enduring caste consciousness. But according to her, they acted according to contingency. Whatever the moment demanded of them at that particular time, at that particular happening of the event, 
सो दे एक्टेड अकॉर्डिंग टू दैट एंड नॉट बिकॉज ऑफ अ कास्ट कॉन्शियसनेस सो अहमद गोज ऑन टू स्टेट दैट सेंग दैट दे एक्टेड बिकॉज ऑफ ओनली देयर कास्ट कॉन्शियसनेस इज ऑफकोर्स एन एसेंशियलिज्म बट वी कॉन्ट से दैट द रोल ऑफ कास्ट कॉन्शियसनेस इज एबसेंट ऑफकोर्स द कास्ट कॉन्शियसनेस प्लेज अ रोल वेन अ लोअर कास्ट रिवोल्स अगेंस्ट एन अपर कास्ट दिस इज वॉट uh ahmed is trying to prove here so i'll give you an example imagine uh, saying that the revolt of 1857 in which uh, the sepoys of uh, the indian army of the british army and uh, they were indians uh, basically so they revolted against the army there was a mutiny because uh, they were given cartridges that were to be supposed to be opened by their mouths and the, the cartridges were glazed with a uh, pig and cow fat which was uh, hurting their religious sentiments so saying that the revolt of 1857 was a result of just that contingent moment where they felt hurt uh, religiously would be such an understatement can you underestimate the role of colonial oppression in the revolt of 1857 it's um, uh, saying that revolt of 1857 was not because of a ca- national consciousness because of an enduring feeling of being dominated by the british colonizers because of the cultural intervention that the british had done for such a long time but saying that it was just a result of the immediate moment of replacement of the cartridges of course it was sparked by the immediate event of course it was sparked by the cartridges as well but that does not mean that the enduring consciousness of being so oppressed for so long by the british wasn't the long lasting fuel that fired the revolt okay so now ahmed is struck by how much importance baba pays to das's argument in favor of the politics of contingency and elaborates baba's inclusion of veena das's passage in his book the location of culture so what is baba saying about veena das those are the first four lines five lines and then uh, ahmed brings veena das's original quotation that baba has mentioned so we'll discuss both so baba says that in das's essay which he finds excellent Das demands a historiography of the subaltern that displaces a paradigm of social action as defined by rational action meaning das wants that when conflicts arise we should not attribute that action to the historical patterns of exploitation by structures of power we shouldn't think that the conflict has any rational explanation and historical reasons so this is what i just said baba further writes that she seeks a form of discourse where affective and iterative writing develops its own language it means that when intellectuals when maybe post colonial intellectuals write or people who are involved in the politics of decolonization when they write appealing to the emotions if they write with repetitive motives repetitive appeals Uh, all right so if they create a discourse that appeals to the emotions of the masses and he writes insisting on the same points again and again the writing develops its own impact with or without the historical consciousness or exploitative structures imagine saying that gandhi could mobilize uh, the masses of india to revolt and to take part in his movement just on the basis of his writing and to saying that the enduring feeling of being dominated by the british at so many levels for such a long time had not did not have the primary role to play in it i think it would be a gross simplification over simplification indeed if someone said that the consciousness of being oppressed for such a long time had nothing to do with it so moving on baba writes this is the historical movement of hybridity as camouflage as a contesting antagonistic agency functioning in the time lag of sign symbol which is a space in between the rules of engagement so according to baba hybridity is a tool of camouflage according to which the person can switch their cultural affiliations not to be fixed with one identity strict category with the master or the slave the merchant or merchant or the uh, marxist 
doesn't have to stick to one identity and this provides him agency, a power to remain in between the space, to find his politics situated in an in-between space within the rules of engagement. He is again talking about erasing the distinctions as I just told you and uh, to use this space as a site for post-colonial politics. Baba goes on to write, it is this theoretical form of political agency I have tried to develop that thus beautifully fleshes out in a historical argument. So here is the main problem Ahmed has with Baba. Baba says that thus beautifully sums up the theoretical form of political agency. Theoretical form of political agency, the textual nature of opposition, the underestimation of material forms of resistance and Bhava says that Das also believes in the same. So you see how these critics refer to each other in a system of mutual citations and referencing, endorsing each other's work as excellent and beautiful and thus creating a currency for post-coloniality as a valid concept endorsed by esteemed critics. Okay? And now Baba brings Das's words. She says of the conflict in which a caste or tribe is locked, which may provide the characteristics of the historical moment to assume that we may know a priori, the mentalities of castes and communities is to take an essentialist perspective, which the evidence produced in the very volumes of subaltern studies would not support. So she clearly says that at the time of a caste based conflict, we should focus on the contingent factor, the motivating factor, the nature of the conflict at the moment and not think that there are mentalities of castes and communities and thinking in this way that it's the caste consciousness that caused the conflict in her view is an essentialism. So now let's see what Ahmed has to say to this. He writes, setting aside the matter of the a priori no one has argued in favor of an a priori knowledges. The striking feature of Das's perspective is its advocacy that when it comes to caste conflicts, each historical moment must be treated as sui generis and as carrying within itself its own explanation, unless one is willing to be accused of that dirty thing, essentialism. That any understanding of a particular conflict must include an understanding of its particularity is so obvious as to be not worth repeating. What Das is advocating here is not just that obvious point, but that the understanding of each conflict be confined to the characteristics of that conflict. What she denies radically is that caste mentalities may indeed have historical depth and enduring features prior to their eruption in the form of a particular conflict. What is denied, in other words, is that caste is a structural and not merely a contingent factor in the dist a feature in the distribution of powers and privileges in Indian society. And that, mem that, that members of particular castes are actual bearers of those earlier histories of power and dispossession so that the conflicts in which castes get logged, to use Das's own telling word, are inseparable from those histories no matter how much a particular expression of that enduring conflict may be studied in its uniqueness. It is always convenient for the bourgeoisie that the worker forgets the history of how capital is accumulated and looks at the current capitalist simply as the provider of jobs and it is always convenient for the upper class Indian to deny that the caste conflicts of today are generally speaking conflicts between the beneficiaries and the victims of the caste structure. When the theorist Baba or Das or any other denies the structural endurance of histories and calls upon us to think only on the contingent of the contingent moment, we are in effect being called upon to overlook the position of class and caste privileges from which such theories emanate and such invocations issue. By this, Ahmed wants to say, of course, no one assumes there is a fixed caste mentality. Saying that is really obvious. It's a straight essentialism and no sensible theorist would be foolish to indulge in it. We'll definitely judge one who bases his arguments on the basis of a fixed caste mentality. But saying that caste consciousness does not have a part to play in caste based conflicts is once again uh, saying that conflicts can be studied according to only the contingent, contingent factors and not by analyzing the fact that caste mentalities may indeed have historical depth 
and enduring features long before their eruption in the form of a particular conflict. So in a way, these critics deny, the post-colonial elitist critics deny that caste is actually a structural problem and not merely a contingent happening. They also deny that the problems created by particular structures of power, like the dispossession that they go through, uh, which was caused to them by the members of particular high castes, they have suppressed and exploiting low caste, uh, exploited low caste people. It has happened historically. So if one day over some issue, if the lower castes revolt, you can't say that the historical pattern had nothing to do in that rupture. The event that ruptured their patience matters no doubt. The contingency also plays a part. It motivated the action. But rejecting the history of exploitation as any part to play, as having any part to play in the conflict is a flawed conclusion. So Das's use of the word locked, in fact, tells us that these people have no choice. They are locked in their situation, in their class caste consciousness. They are engulfed in problems historically created by the more powerful. And then Ahmed goes on to connect this trend in theory to general way in which exploiters behave. He says, it's always convenient for the owners of modes of production or for the masters that the worker forgets the history of how capital is accumulated and looks at the current capitalist simply as the provider of jobs. It's always convenient for the upper class Indian to deny that ca class con caste conflicts of today are conflicts between the victims and the oppressors of a particular caste privilege. Okay, so uh, it's it's even better for them if they forget that such a relationship happened and they focus only on the contingent moment. And when critics like Baba or Das, they theorize in this manner, they deny the structural endurance of histories. They deny that histories have endurance, that they percolate from generation to generation and still a create a consciousness of exploitation. It, it also calls upon theorists like Ahmad to think only of the contingent moment, as I just told you. So uh, what he says is that these critics are asking other critics to overlook the position, overlook the uh, role of caste and class from which such theoretical work emerges. In the next paragraph, Ahmed writes, in terms of his own logic though, Baba is right. Thus his denial that there might be such a thing as a caste mentality and her assertion that all historical moments are sui generis is entirely consistent with Baba's own assertion that explanations for human action must be non-rational and that historical agents are constituted in displacement. Such premises preclude, I would argue, the very basis of political action. For the idea of a collective human agent that is organized group of exploited castes fighting for their rights against upper caste privilege presumes both uh, communicative rationality as well as possibility of rational action as such. It presumes, in other words, that agencies are constituted not in flux and displacement but in given historical locations. So, Ahmed goes on to tell you that uh, Baba's politics and Das's politics somehow correspond to each other. Then the names of their concepts may be different, but in a way they endorse each other's ideas. So, he says that Das's faith in the contingent moment as the site of politics is consistent with Baba's uh, assertion that the explanation for human action must be non-rational. By non-rational, it means it should be without any logic of a historical continuity of exploitation, of a structural endurance of history. And that po the politics of post-coloniality begin at the moment of displacement. When he says moment of displacement, Das says the moment of contingency and they basically mean the same thing. But Ahmed says that they may consider themselves as right as they want. The problem that he has with their politics is the fact that their politics make impossible and do not have any space or mention of actual material political action, actual struggle against the structures of power. For according to Ahmed, when historically oppressed groups decide to fight for their rights, like low caste people trying to fight for their rights against upper caste privilege, uh, both communicative rationality and rational explanation, they both matter. Uh, communicating to express the rationality of resistance and revolt, it matters. So he insists that agencies are not constituted in a flux at the time of displacement, at a moment of contingency, 
but they are formed in an endurance of a historical consciousness of being aware that the pattern of their exploitation has been historically uh, has historically sustained has historically been repeated so in it is in that consciousness that agencies are constituted according to ahmed now coming to the last paragraph thankfully history does not consist of perpetual migration so that the universality of displacement that bhaba claims both as the general human condition and the desirable philosophical position is tenable neither as description of the of the world nor as generalized po uh, political possibility he may wish to erase the distinction between commerce and revolution between the mercantile and the marxist and he is welcome to do his to his preferences but that hardly amounts to a theory of something called post coloniality most individuals are really not free to fashion themselves anew with each passing day nor do communities arise out of uh, out of and fade into the thin air of the infinitely contingent among the migrants themselves only the privileged can live a life of constant mobility and surplus ple surplus pleasure between Whit uh, whitman and warhol as it were most migrants tend to be poor and experience displacement not as cultural plenitude but as torment what they seek is not displacement but precisely a place from where they may begin a new with some sense of a stable future post coloniality is also like most things a matter of class now ahmed brings some points that i personally find very convincing he says that history is not formed in perpetual migration no one wants perpetual migration displacement is not a universal condition no one finds his empowerment in displacement uh, neither it is a point of departure for any philosophical deliberation if bhaba wants to raise the distinction between the master and the slave the trader and the marxist it's it's his choice according to ahmed okay uh, but that doesn't result into a theory of post coloniality as such ahmed mentions some real situations and practical problems faced by disadvantaged people he says most people don't have the means to change their lives to reshape it for better with each passing day he says that communities are formed in historical associations rather than the moment of contingency it's not that they arise and fade out in the moment of the happening of an action of the moment of uh, in the moment of contingency even with the migrants he says uh, only the privileged ones can live a life of constant mobility for whom deliberate movement in the form of vacations or relocations are possible and uh, only these uh, privileged ones only the privileged migrants have the luxury of surplus pleasure what is surplus pleasure the kind of pleasure people can derive when they have surplus time or surplus money or both okay so whitman and warhol are not the only two positions to live in there is an in between space of actual struggles practical problems which common people go through every day most migrants according to ahmed and i agree most migrants tend to be poor and for them displacement is not a pleasurable cultural experience uh, and an opportunity to experience new cultures it is it is for them a torment a pain that they have no choice in evading they don't want displacement so what they want is a place from where they can start their struggle with a hope not of further displacement but of a stable future in these terms post coloniality as bhaba uses the term ahmed says it appears not a political tool of resistance but a textual matter accessible only by the elite class only by the elite class of intellectuals and with this he ends this section now guys i'm aware that it, this has been a fairly long video but believe me this was the longest part of this essay and it has mostly been covered the next part is going to be super short as compared to the other videos and uh, now please bear with me because it wasn't possible to uh, explain each and everything in a shorter video you can skip the parts that uh, you find are repetitive or too explanatory so uh, thanks so much for bearing with me uh, and uh, i would like to reiterate that in this section uh, ahmed critiques three of bhaba's points number one is his use of cultural hybridity philosophical hybridity ambivalence and contingency number two uh, that these theorists 
believe in the collapse of nation state and all such concepts and number 3 the coming of a globalized electronic postmodern culture with this quick revision i sign off thank you so much for watching this longish video and uh, see you soon with part 4 thanks a lot for watching have a nice day